First of all, good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Prasant Mohapatra and I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Research on uh, the academic side. Uh, I'm from Cambodia Science. So um, at the start of the pandemic, at the very beginning, we started this culture of uh, Friday at 10.30. I mean, it has become a habit for many of us uh, just to look for this forum um, at Friday at 10.30. And um, it was initially uh, targeted for COVID-19 research. So uh, School of Medicine and Office of Research were um, co-hosting the event um, and we had weekly meetings. We, um, you know, with the change and with all the activities around COVID-19 research, we, we got a lot of... Uh, Miles out of it in building up the intellectual capital around the campus and beyond. Uh, slowly, we we got encouraged and we kind of morphed this forum and we renamed the forum as Team Research Forum. So the goal now is we want to, we will host this, our Office of Research will host this in collaboration with uh, our deans in order to bring topics that are of significant interest to the campus and we invite the entire campus community in order to come and participate in this event and the goal is you all will organically grow your um, partnership in building up your research profiles and go after more collaborative and interdisciplinary research. And you know, um, one good example will be, I don't want to steal the thunder, one good example will be in today's presentation on how a, a large team is being formed for something big and they will talk about it. So with that, the, the theme, again, we, we create a theme for each of these uh, Friday forums. Uh, today's theme is uh, indoor air quality. And we have a team of researchers which will um, uh, you know, engage all of us in a discussion related to indoor air quality. With me today, our co-host, uh, Dean Richard Corsi, uh, I'll give a brief introduction uh, about Rich and Rich will take over from there. And uh, this is very interesting that Rich's own research is uh, along the theme of today's uh, forum. So um, with that, it's, uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dean Richard Carsey. Dean um, Carsey is our newest Dean in the College of Engineering. He was previously a faculty member and department chair in civil and architectural and environmental engineering at UT Austin. Um, I believe he was there for 24 years and then as Dean of Engineering and Computer Science at Portland State University. Um, the, the most um, interesting part of his uh, bio is he earned both his master's and doctoral degrees uh, from UC Davis. Uh, so um, for the past 25 years, uh, Dean Carsey uh, has been involved in research related to indoor air quality and is internationally recognized in that domain. Um, he, um, you know, the, the areas of in investigation uh, that he pursues includes the use of building materials to remove or sequester uh, pollutants in buildings, chemistry of building decontamination, and methods and benefits of reducing um, the U.S. population exposure to the ozone inside residential, office, school, and long-term healthcare buildings. Um, Dean Corsi is a member and immediate past president of the Academy of Fellows of the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate. And his research has been cited or featured in many of the leading media outlets like New York Times, Washington Post, The Economist, NPR, and Business Week, among others. With that, uh, Rich, it's all yours. And thank you so much, Prasant. And from what Prasant said, you can probably tell that I'm sort of uh, one of the elders of the uh, current indoor air quality field. So I've seen the field go through fits and starts and ups and downs, uh, but I'm really excited about the future of the field now that the public uh, and more on academia are sort of tuning into the importance of indoor air quality. And I think the importance of indoor air quality is really reflected in, in American activity patterns. So uh, before the pandemic, it's slightly lower now, but before the pandemic, the average American lived to be 79 years old. 
We spend 69 of our 79 years of our lifetime domiciled inside of buildings. And of those 69 years, 54 are spent in our own homes during our lifetime. So that's a dominant environment for exposure to air pollution. 26 of those years are spent lying horizontally on a mattress in, in our bedroom while we sleep. And there's almost no research on our exposure to indoor air pollutants in the sleep microenvironment. We only spend six years outdoors on average during our lifetime and four years in motor vehicles. So we spend a greater fraction of our time inside buildings than most whales spend submerged below the surface of the ocean. Think about that. We are indoor creatures. Um, and if you, if you do an analysis of outdoor air pollution levels and indoor air pollution levels, it's pretty easy to show that during our lifetime, the, the large percentage of the air pollution that we inhale during our lifetime, we inhale while we're indoors by virtue of the fact that we spend so much of our lives indoors. And that's true even for pollutants of outdoor origin. And that's important. And that's exciting to me because that means we ought to be thinking of ways of designing buildings to dramatically reduce population exposure to outdoor air pollution, to, to essentially you know, turn back all the health effects that outdoor air pollution causes. At the same time, design buildings so that we reduce the amount of harmful pollutants that are emitted inside the building. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of interesting chemistry in, inside buildings that is different than outside by virtue of the, the nature and the levels of pollutants that react indoors versus outdoors. There's a strong tension uh, that exists between trying to reduce building energy use and, and indoor air quality. And so that's a tension that we have to deal with. Um, and there's so much more research that's, that's really needed in this field. And I think that there's a future for the indoor air quality field that becomes kind of this new environmental frontier of indoor environmental science and engineering, not just environmental science and engineering. So I'm excited about the presentations today and I'll introduce uh, Chris Kappa, who's our uh, chair of Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, which means he's actually my boss, or will be as soon as I submit some paperwork I need to submit. Um, and Chris has has got vast experience uh, in the area of uh, in the area of air pollution, and is working in the indoor environments, uh, and has also published some really great recent papers on the effectiveness of masks. So I'll just turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let me get my screen sharing going. All right. Um, thank you so much, Rich and, and Prasant for that great introduction. Um, so first I just wanna start by thanking Tim and, and Nina also for presenting today. And, and I wanna mention that both of them are part of a larger effort that we're leading to put together or to um, bring a, a NSF Engineering Research Center to Davis in, in collaboration with these other institutions. And so some of the work that we're talking about today would be the types of things that we would do within that ERC just on a grander scale and pushing things a lot further. Um, but for today, I'm gonna to talk about some specific work that I've been involved in um, over the past few years, um, actually preceding the, the, the pandemic uh, in, in, in some cases here where we're thinking about the, the benefits of, of different types of face coverings for respiratory aerosol source control uh, as one side of things. And then also uh, where we're working to characterize things like low cost aerosol filters that are being put forward uh, these days. And I have to start by thanking everybody who's been uh, involved in all of this, a great team of, of uh, students at, at Davis, as well as uh, faculty at Davis and, and elsewhere. Um, so Rich gave a nice, nice introduction on, on how much time we spend in indoor environments, but it, I want to emphasize here, right, our indoor air quality really depends on a lot of different factors, right? It depends on exogenous sources, so outdoor air pollution, you know, fires, wildfires, factories, cars, all these different things. It depends on our endogenous sources, all the things happening inside as well, and that's going to be, you know, in the context of respiratory diseases, that's going to be things like people speaking, talking, breathing, and coughing. Um, but that's also lots of things like cooking, you know, animals, vacuuming, 
uh, indoor fires and cleaning products that we, we use in our indoor environments. And these are what kind of put the pollutants into the air in the first place. And then we can think about what happens to those. And that's where we have to start thinking about things like building ventilation as key components and how our buildings operate with passive or active ventilation aspects, uh, or whether we're trying to use any sort of in-situ cleaning methods as well, um, air purifiers of varying sorts um, that people might, might try to use. And I'll just say some are better than others. And I think Tim will talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, and then there's also the important aspect of, of the reactions that go on within our indoor environments as well after things do get emitted, and that's both in the gas phase and on surfaces. And so piecing all of this together is, is we have to understand all of these different aspects to really understand and, and, and improve our indoor air quality, um, which really is kind of the an underappreciated uh, uh, area of public health for for forever. <laughs> and that's obviously changing now uh, in the face of the pandemic. So for today, I'm just going to focus on two aspects here. One is thinking about the role of, of respiratory aerosols that we produce and how we might reduce those. Uh, and then also thinking about the role of, of um, some filters, in particular air, quality, um, air pollution filters. And so just want to start by um, introducing the type of experiments that we do. So we have been focused here at Davis on measurements uh, of respiratory particle emissions by real people. Um, we have some instrumentation together and we have people come in and speak and cough and talk and um, breathe in front, of, in front of this instrumentation. We can measure the particles that come out in a very clean environment so we can distinguish between the background particles and what's, what's just coming out when, when people are doing these activities. And I just want to emphasize that Davis really is a leader in making measurements with actual people. There are a lot of people measure, making measurements on masks and things like that uh, in various ways right now. And I know Nina has some nice work on that and, and Tim has some contributions on that. But we've been really leaders in doing this with actual uh, people. And I have to give a lot of credit here to uh, uh, Bill Ristenpart, who brought me into this in the first place, uh, and then Seema Asadi, the graduate student who really led a lot of the initial work here. Um, and so just before we get to, to thinking about masks and face coverings, some background on, on uh, respiratory emissions in, in general, um, you know, we can think about speaking, which is what we do a lot, right? I'm doing it a lot now. We don't cough that often. You know, we are breathing all the time, but speaking emits a lot more than breathing. And so speaking becomes a really important indoor source of respiratory aerosols. And it turns out that what we emit actually depends a little bit on what we say um, in the end, but 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 the language that we speak, the way that we vocalize doesn't matter so much, but how loud we speak really has a big impact in the end. So the louder you speak, the more we emit. And this has raised some questions that we've been probing, such as you know, could things like quiet zones help reduce respiratory disease transmission? How might this vary depending on different environments? Um, but beyond just thinking about you know, this, this no, um, volume dependence, we've also found that some people just emit a lot more than others, even at the same um, volume level. And there, there isn't a clear physiological basis for this yet. Uh, it, it's not clear that it depends on things like, is it just a bigger person, a smaller person, right? Um, and so one of, the, one of the open questions that we still want to think about more is, is what physiological factors really determine who these super emitters are. And it seems like this behavior is relatively consistent over, over time. But also another broader question is just are super emitters potentially also super spreaders when it comes to actual disease transmission? Because we've been looking at healthy people here. So those are some open questions still that we want to want to address. Um, now turning to, to face coverings, you know, we can really think of these as a source control um, aspect here. We're trying to reduce the, the emission of respiratory particles into the surrounding environment in the end. And we've been able to, to, we've found that, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, but still important to show that there's a tremendous dependence on the mask material in terms of, of the source control that you get. So some types of masks, uh, surgical masks can be, can be pretty good, N95s, not surprisingly, can be pretty good uh, in terms of what will pass through them. But some cloth masks and other types of masks aren't nearly as good in terms of the level of reduction that you get for particles that pass through those masks. 
uh, in the end. And these are just two studies that have looked at this in different ways. In terms of, these are looking specifically at the particles that have passed through the masks. But one thing that we've also found that I, I wanna mention here is with some of the cloth masks is that some of them seem to actually shed fibers off of them. Um, it's, not, it's not always just respiratory aerosols that come out. Sometimes we get fibers from, from shedding. It could be fibers from the masks. It could be skin that's coming off. Um, but all of this is the potential for then aerosolized fomites of, of, of previous um, uh, uh, things that have deposited in the end. So that's, that's something to always keep in mind. But this is again what, what passes through the mask. But the other thing that we know is important um, is how well um, the mask fits in the end. And whether you have, I'll say, unintentional leaks, so that would be really a mask fit, or intentional leaks uh, that you might have in the context of of vented N95 respirators that, that do exist and are around. And, and, um, and so here's some, some measurements uh, that we've made on the overall source control efficiency that you get. So when you account for the different leaks that you get and not just what passes directly through the mask material, and we see that there's huge variability here, again, with some types of, in this case, a vented N95 doing not very good at all. Another time it does, okay, if you tape up that vent, it does a lot better. Um, so, you know, there is air going through that vent. Um, surgical masks, you know, they don't fit perfectly, but they do filter out a lot when it passes through them in general. So they can be pretty good, especially if you wear them nice and tightly. And 95s, they can be great if you're wearing them well, as we, we should expect. And then I want to mention um, one thing in particular, which is through a collaboration with the San Francisco Opera, um, the development of, of a new mask for, for stinging in particular. And I want to talk about that. But first, I want to thank uh, um, Jessica Hazard, uh, who, who led um, uh, some of these experiments. Uh, I'm here. She's a graduate student in the civil engineering department. And so looking to the singer's mask a little bit more, here I just want to emphasize a point that really collaboration can help drive innovation. And this was this was something that came to me from the San Francisco Opera and from a, 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 um, a surgeon actually, or a doctor at um, UCSF, who is also an opera singer, who were interested in finding ways for singers to keep practicing uh, during the pandemic. And good options didn't exist that really allowed you to sing, uh, move your jaw as much as you needed to, but get good source control efficiency. And so um, they had an initial design and I helped them re um, refine that design. But then we actually did testing in the lab with opera singers. We had people singing opera in our lab into our instruments and we characterized um, the efficiency of the performance of these masks as well as how singing differs from, from speaking and it's about twice as many particles get emitted at the same volume. But, but in the end, we, we were able to come up with a design where we had really high efficiency for source control of particles and actually for controlling uh, what they inhale uh, as well. And so this, this really shows how kind of bringing people together um, can, can help with, with innovation. And then continuing in that theme, I wanna change gears here for, for the last couple minutes here. And that is thinking about um, kind of community driven solutions to help improve uh, indoor air quality. And here I wanna give a, a shout out to to Dean Corsi um, for a, a kind of a conceptual design here on, on, a, on a low cost DIY way that people could try to improve their air quality in the context of the pandemic, but also well beyond that as well. And that is uh, through um, construction of, of, a, of an air filter, uh, a particle filter that just relies on a box fan and a couple um, pretty available um, uh, filters that you might put in your HVAC system, right? So not a fancy HEPA system, a lot less expensive, right? And the thing is that this was an idea put out there, I believe on Twitter is probably where it in initiated. And now there's been thousands of these built worldwide. This has had a huge impact. And in fact, on our own campus, right, we've been using this for various outreach activities, um, uh, really led by uh, Teresa Pistaccini here, and this is an activity at a, at a school in Sacramento and some of the students building these and learning about how filtration works and things. So you can take this science um, and, these, and these DIY solutions and move them forward. However, great idea, but 
lacked characterization. And that's where we tried to come in and actually work on characterizing. Okay, great idea. How efficient are these, these things in the end? And so we did some, we've been doing some experiments and this has been led by uh, Rachel Del Porto and, and Monique um, Kuntz here, uh, making measurements uh, in our building on campus in Gaussie Hall and looking at the efficiency of this box in terms of, of, of how well it pulls particles out of the room. And on the left here is if you just have the room by itself with no air filter on the right is if you turn that, turn that, um, that box on and you can see the particle concentration goes down a lot faster, right? And that indicates that it's doing something. And in fact, it's removing particles. And if we look overall and we actually quantify these things, we see that, that compared to some other commercial um, uh, systems that you can buy for a hundred bucks on the left here, or maybe 200, maybe a bit more on the, in the middle, you know, our, our $50 box here on the right is about twice as good as even that $200 one, right? And so, and I also wanna say we did this in our class too. Um, so we introduced this as a lab in, in the air pollution class that I teach. So, you know, we can be doing science and we can be integrating this into education here uh, overall and having a lot of fun as students put these together. Um, and so that I just wanna, you know, I'll finish um, with, with just a summary here. Um, I, I don't need to read all this, but um, um, We've been having a lot of fun getting involved and in helping to think about ways to improve indoor air quality uh, in a lot of different contexts, but there's still a lot of work to do in this area. Um, and so at, in this case, I wanna turn it over to our next speaker. Uh, and that is um, Professor Tim Bertram from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Chemistry and Civil and Environmental Engineering departments. Um, so Tim, I'll stop sharing and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone for uh, the opportunity to share a few things uh, that are happening here in the Midwest on similar topics. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen here. What I wanna talk about today is a collaborative initiative that happened here at the University of Wisconsin, which was essentially in the summer of 2020, I guess, when as a campus, we were faced with the question of how do we safely bring students back into the classroom and what do we know about uh, aerosol transmission in the indoor environment? How do we set up classrooms? How do we set up different types of intervention strategies to reduce exposure? Um, and, and what's known about that? Uh, this picture here uh, was an experiment that was run in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin to, to attempt to address a few questions and build upon this extensive amount of literature that was available at the time. First question here was really to think about uh, what do we know about the spatial distribution of aerosol particles in a typical classroom? Is it well mixed? Are there hot spots? How fast do they distribute? We'd seen lots of really beautiful modeling studies showing these plumes of aerosol particles moving around a classroom. And we were curious what that looked like from a measurement perspective. Questions about in-room loss rate of aerosol particles, but moreover questions about assessing intervention strategies for just reducing the concentration of particles themselves. Very similar to what Chris just showed for the, um, for the Corsi box. Um, and so we set out in this classroom here a typical uh, classroom, at least from the context of, of our university um, in terms of dimensions and size. Uh, this is a classroom that has variable ventilation that's tied to the occupancy of the classroom, something that we hadn't initially even considered that when we reduce the occupancy of our classrooms, a typical strategy we wanted to do that we might actually reduce the ventilation rates. Um, and so in this case, there's, this is a variable system and you can see what those uh, supply flow rates are. Um, and the university asked some pretty simple questions. Essentially, could you replicate the emission of particulates say from one of our mannequins here and be able to measure the spatial distribution of the particles around that individual mannequin? How would it change if we put the state issued cloth mask on our source mannequin? How might the concentrations in the near field or in the far field of this room change in response to that, that source control that we have? What would be the effect of adding an in-room HEPA filtration unit? And where would you put it if you just had one? That's a question I probably won't talk too much about today in terms of the placement. 
And then this third one that I'll spend more time talking about is this, uh, the idea of electronic air cleaners that had become, um, or maybe reemerged as a better word uh, in, this, uh, in this time. What do we know about them? And do some of the claims that were made uh, hold when you test them directly against changing your ventilation or inserting a HEPA filtration unit? So this is our experiment here. You can see uh, one of our, our mannequins here. Uh, unfortunately for this mannequin, uh, we drilled a hole in the back of its head so that we could detect, <laughs> connect a, a aerosol source to it. Uh, we carried this aerosol source. You can see it's down here underneath the table. It's carried in carbon dioxide. So we can actually measure both the carbon dioxide concentration spatially around the room, in addition to the particle size distributions around the room. Um, you can see these little plexiglass plates that are hanging down from the ceiling. Those are little NDIR CO2 sensors. So we're mapping in the spatial area here, uh, carbon dioxide. So we can actually sort of see where this plume is moving and, and look at that in detail. And we also place some optical particle counters around the room as well to be able to map out this spatial pattern. Um, we took um, the results that Chris just talked about in terms of the size distribution of respiratory aerosol, that's shown here on the left-hand side. And we tried to generate an aerosol source that looked about similar in terms of the size of those particulates, but of course was not actual respiratory aerosol. So we generated this um, essentially from uh, a similar method to having your home humidifier, but instead of using deionized water, you use a salty solution. And if you control the salt content in that solution, you can control the size distribution of the particles being formed. So we generate a plume here within our contained uh, vessel here that we vent through the back, through the front of the mannequin um, that's shown here. And if you look really closely, you can see the details of that plume coming right out there. So the first question here, was simply, what does the aerosol concentration look like? These are for particles greater than 500 nanometers distributed around this room. This is for the low ventilation case. So this is 1.3 air changes per hour. The source is this pink star here sitting at this one desk. The circles here are individual measurements. Okay, so any uh, color inside a circle is an actual measurement. So you can trust that as a measurement point. And in between the circles is interpolated. So in between is an interpolated function. But this information, it gives you some interesting information here. Um, the, you can see uh, each one of these squares. There's four squares of the supply ducts and the return is in the, in the bottom left of the room. Um, you can see a little bit of the plume of aerosol particles being pushed away by one of those supplies. Uh, you can see here the color is normalized to the concentration of aerosol right in front of the source. So you can see in your six foot radius or so that there is, of course, that's the reduction here that you would see just because you're sitting by the source. Um, and this is apparent because you have particle loss throughout the room in addition to the loss due to the ventilation itself. A couple of things that are important, of course, is that obviously you may not want to be sitting right in front of the, of, of the source itself, but even if you're sitting anywhere in the um, far field of the room, concentrations are still about 30% that of near the source region. What does the picture look like if you change the ventilation? So as would it be expected, if we increase this to four changes per hour, you still have that near source component. We're still emitting the same number of particles in that near field, but the far field component reduces somewhat significantly. Now you're down to 10 or 15% of that if you were right in front of the source itself. So as expected, you know, based upon decades of research, you know, this holds quite nicely. What is also interesting to look at is how uh, well mixed, at least the far field here is. And I think that has some implications when we start to think about where the placement of a HEPA filtration unit is in this far field region. Obviously, if you knew where an infected individual would be, you would place the HEPA filter right in front of that person, but that's something we don't know. <laughs> so placing it in the far field at any place is an advantage. The last thing that we did here was to place this, our state issued red Wisconsin uh, cloth mask over our mannequin, you can see a few things happen from this. One is that the plume that's near the source region is more diffuse 
um, as it is released and say more isotropically and it's at lower velocity around that source. Um, but you get, of course, a further 20 to 30% reduction. This is a typical cloth mass, so not of the quality of the mass that Chris had introduced here before. So as we move to this idea of intervention, um, there three, were three ideas that were put forth by the university. Um, one was, well, maybe this red component here is that we could increase ventilation in all of our rooms. Those that have variable ventilation, well, let's at least set them at the highest rate so we can get up to four to five air changes per hour, so an additional 700 or so cubic feet per minute. So we test this as an experiment. Essentially, we do something very similar to what Chris just showed. This is not a log axis, though. Um, and we just leave the aerosol particles on for the entire experiment. So we're not turning them off and watching the decay. So you essentially achieve a different steady state. So at time zero is when the intervention starts. The red line is, is essentially adding an additional 720 cubic feet per minute. You can see that decay out quite nicely to a new steady state. The black line is what happens if you add an in-room HEPA filtration unit. This one was about 650. It was more expensive than the DIY box, I will say. Um, and so I expect if we had a, had a Corsi box in here, we'd be doing quite well. But this, of course, does exactly as you would expect. We moved this HEPA unit in many different locations around the room, and we got the same result. The third was the idea of adding an electronic air cleaner. This was a bipolar ionizer device. Um, and so we had, we tried three or four different of these devices and every single one that we tried looked like this. There was no effect on the particle concentrations above 500 nanomol, na, or sorry, nanometers. Um, despite the fact one of the claims was that what these devices would do would be, to would be to add ions to the room to enhance the deposition or removal of particles from the room rate, either through coagulation or direct deposition. And we found no evidence for all of the devices that we, that we looked at. But we did see evidence that the device was operating, but not operating in the way that you would like. On the left-hand side, what I'm showing is on the top panel is the size of the particles. Now these are very small. This is from 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers as a function of time. And the ionizer was turned on here just a little bit after noon. And what you see is what we in the atmospheric chemistry community refer to as a new particle formation event. This is completely expected underneath the idea of adding ions to a room that is full of volatile organic material is that you drive ion-induced nucleation. This is something that happens in the atmospheric outdoor world all of the time under conditions where you add a lot of ions. But here we added far more ions than you ever would find in the outdoor world. So you can drive nucleation and growth rates that are actually quite fast. Um, this device also generated some ozone as well. So this is a very complicated um, soup of atmospheric chemistry happening, but it is largely being driven by this ionizer. So while the manufacturer claims that ions generated from bipolar ionization will lead to enhanced particle loss, in many of the cases we looked at, they led to particle formation and of small particle formation um, that would be increased in terms of deposition in your lungs. So when we presented these, this, these results the first time, many of the manufacturers came back to us and said, well, that doesn't actually matter. That's not how these devices work. They, they, they actually work by generating highly reactive ions that go out into the room and can deactivate uh, viruses uh, in place. And so what you want to do is load the room with the ions and they will lead to virus deactivation. And the claim was that they would generate very reactive ions like O2 minus. And so we naturally asked the question, well, do you know that? What, what is actually the composition of the ions that are being generated by these devices? Um, and this was an unknown. So we decided to measure this. Um, so we took a, a mass spectrometer that we have equipped to be able to directly measure ions in the atmosphere. And we took a mass spectra of the ions generated from these typical devices. And what you find is also not ex unexpected from the atmospheric, outdoor atmospheric chemistry literature is that a very reactive ion like O2 minus has a lifetime of a fraction of a second because it reacts with the neutral molecules in the room and it will uh, transfer its charge over to those, those neutral molecules forming stable ions. And so the ions that are actually in the room are things like chloride ions, nitrate ions, 
or clusters of nitrate and nitric acid. These are typical things that you would find in, in, um, in your saliva to begin with. They're not things that are going to be able to lead to strong deactivation. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Um, I think some of the uh, lessons that we learned from this are these largely uh, collaborative interdisciplinary uh, ideas um, can lead to new research directions, um, especially for us you know, as atmospheric chemists that the translation of knowledge from some parts of the, um, of the research community can be useful in, in others. You know, for example, the ability to measure speciated ions in the indoor environment. Uh, I'll thank the two primary students in, in our group that worked on this, um, which is Stephanie Richards and Joe Gord, and a, just a fantastic collaboration with the engineering department here at UW-Madison. So I'll stop uh, sharing here and uh, pass the, um, the screen here over to Nina Vance. Uh, Nina is an assistant professor um, in mechanical and environmental engineering at CU Boulder. Thank you, Tim. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I can still see you all. Let me know if there are issues. Um, all right, so um, I think we're switching gears a little bit from two very pandemic related and relevant talks to some work that actually thankfully happened before the pandemic. But I think it, it will add to the conversation as a good example of a large collaborative study in indoor air quality. So I'm talking to you about the science community uh, in the chemistry of indoor environments. Um, so first I wanna drive home the message if it hasn't been made clear yet by this point, that there is a continued need to understand chemical and physical processes in indoor environments. Um, my computer just did something weird. Let me stop sharing and start again. Hmm. That's new. It'll just take a second. Okay. You guys can see that? Okay, we're back on. All right, so I think uh, Rich make, made the case better than anyone could that we spend the majority of our time indoors, we should really care about these processes that happen indoors. Uh, additionally, with buildings becoming more and more airtight, uh, that's great because it lowers energy consumption and the penetration of outdoor pollutants, but it could also increase our exposure to indoor air pollutants, things that are produced indoors through our everyday activities like Chris mentioned before. Uh, indoor processes, both physical and chemical, are also very likely to be different from outdoors. So we can borrow some of the knowledge we have from atmospheric chemistry indoors, but most of it we cannot. It needs to be adapted. And that's because we have different sources of indoor air pollution. Even when you consider the penetration of outdoor pollution indoors, it's going to look a little different. We have different types and amounts of surfaces indoors, and that's likely to play a large role in chemical and physical processes. And we have different oxidants that are gonna be driving the chemistry indoors. We have a lot of cleaning products and artificial things that we put in the indoor environment that can drive chemistry. Whereas outdoors, photochemistry, the sunlight is usually the main driver for that, those reactions. So I wanna make the case that indoor pollution is dynamic, it's complex. It needs to be investigated both in controlled laboratory experiments and some examples that I'll give you later of realistic field studies indoors. So indoor chemistry as a, as a scientific field, in my opinion, is a pretty niche field, not necessarily new, but it's, in my opinion, something that is in between atmospheric chemistry and indoor air quality, including very important components from building science, exposure science, et cetera, that provide the context and the motivation for understanding these chemical reactions indoors. Uh, indoor chemistry as a scientific field, as I mentioned, is, in my opinion, pretty niche. If you compare publications in the past decades from atmospheric chemistry and indoor air quality, uh, you'll see that those two are, are kind of kind of similar. I, I was really surprised to see the numbers for indoor air quality kind of surpassing atmospheric chemistry in recent years. That, that came to me as a big surprise when I was digging up these numbers from Web of Science. But you can see indoor chemistry starting to pop up at the bottom there. Uh, so very niche, not totally new. There's been publications as, as far back as the early 90s in indoor chemistry. 
Um, so based on all this, there is this community of scientists in indoor chemistry, we call it indoor chem. This work is funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. They have a large program to try to uh, motivate this sci you know, niche scientific field in indoor chemistry. Um, grants started coming out for that program in 2013, and uh, the community building aspect really started in 2018. So we have several activities that relate to community building in the scientific field. I like to divide them into two broad categories, as you can see in this slide. Internal community building includes signature field campaigns, and I'll talk a lot about those science meetings and special symposia at you know meetings that are already occurring which like to um, have some special symposia specifically for indoor chemistry topics uh, we also have our own science meetings we had two we plan to have a third before the end of the well there will be i think four total not all of them led by us uh, by the end of this this program we have a newsletter that comes out every every other month or so we have a website that lists project descriptions and publications Additionally, we also like to focus on external community building. Are we good? Can you guys still hear me? I hear some, okay. Uh, external community building is focused on science communication. Okay. Uh, so we're trying to broaden the understanding of the, you know, the scientific under findings from this study to, to the broader community, including our website, we have a blog on the website, social media, media presence, which in the later years have been focused just on Twitter because that has been just really emerging as the main, the main media for medium for, um, for academics, I would say. Um, we also make YouTube videos for a much hopefully broader audience. And then we've been collaborating with some TV producers uh, to help um, create some interesting TV show episodes that focus on the chemistry of your home. Um, I won't have the time obviously to talk about all this. So today I'm gonna focus only on our signature field campaigns because uh, for the academic realm, it's probably the most exciting part of the program. So first I'll cover home chem. The bulk of the rest of my presentation will be about home chem. This was a study that we performed in the summer of 2018 called House Observations of Microbial Environmental Chemistry. Actually, Rich Corsi was part of the team at the time because he was still at UT Austin. Um, so this was a detailed investigation in indoor chemistry. We decided, you know, if we're gonna build community in this field and if we're gonna bring atmospheric chemists that perhaps had never looked at the indoor air before in their careers. Uh, how fun would it be to get everybody together in this one test house and try to measure as much as we possibly can out of that indoor air and some surfaces as well. So we had 30 state of the art instruments or even more. Uh, we had over faculty, 20 faculty members from 13 universities in the US and Canada. You can see their logos at the bottom of my slide. Uh, we had some industrial and governmental partners that have loaned us instrumentation and also collaborated in modeling afterwards. Uh, in total, we had over 60 researchers on site. And at this point, I'd like to acknowledge my co-PI, Professor Dauphine Farmer from the Department of Chemistry at Colorado State University. Uh, we like to share the credit for running this field campaign together. Um, so the reason we went to UT Austin is because they have this amazing test house in their research campus. So the test house is basically a research instrument. Nobody's allowed to live in it or spend the night, uh, but we can do whatever we want with it outside of that. We could drill holes through the walls and replace a window with plywood and put, you know, inlets through through windows and doors and everywhere. Um, the house also has multiple uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems that we could choose to use. It had a continuous outdoor air supply and monitoring of several house parameters, which became very, very useful. So you can see a picture of the house here, some of our instrument trailers here on this side, and a little floor plan of the house. Uh, some photos of move-in day, you can still see the U-Haul truck and some of the instrument trailers that were installed on the outside of the house to house most of the larger uh, instruments that have a lot of heat output. So those were not inside the house. And here's a photo of the inside. It does not look like your average home by any means. We try to keep the furniture very Spartan because we did not want the furniture 
foam and all of that to be a main driver of the chemistry, especially if it were new. A lot of instruments did not allow for an inlet at all or a very long inlet, so they had to be inside the house, as you can see over here and here in the front. Um, there are also, you know, probes for surface temperature, CO2 measurements, etc., all over the house. Um, now I'll just briefly go over some of the home chem team and their measurements uh, using this nice photo from the open house event that we had. Uh, oh, and there's Rich right there. And then um, we had aerosol physics measurements with a variety of particle sizers, including high end and low cost instruments. We had some aerosol chemistry measurements with some aerosol mass spectrometers. We had several volatile organic compound measurements, including three chemical ionization mass spectrometry instruments, a PTR TOF MS, and a gas chromatographer. Um, we also had measurements of oxidants and trace gases from a variety of instruments that you can just see over there on the screen. Don't want to go through the laundry list. And finally, there is a team from there is a team from uh, several teams that were looking at surface chemistry, those results still coming, but there's a team from specifically from UC San Diego that swabbed all of the surfaces in the house, all the doorknobs and the toilet and the sink, everything at the beginning of the campaign and at the end of the campaign. And what they're actually writing on right now is the change in the microbiome throughout this month long of occupation in the house and human activity. Very cool stuff. Um, so, of course, I can't go through home, home chem results in the two minutes that I have left. Uh, we've already had 17 published papers, which give a really good, you know, motivation for performing collaborative research like this. It's very exciting. Everybody is very motivated to analyze their data and compare results among different instrumentations. Um, and then I'll just show you one plot from my group on indoor particulate matter. This shows you that we performed several scripted activities throughout that month long campaign. I did not go through the detailed experimental schedule that we had an activity log, but we had some days in which all that we did was open up the house that's at the bottom panel here time series of particle uh, mass concentrations. These are size segregated by color. So you can see uh, in blue and green, you have PM10 and PM20, very coarse PM. And that's what was coming in as you open the house, right? And then you close the house, the levels quickly, quickly go down. If you look at the y-axis, you'll see that particle concentrations in enhanced by maybe 10 micrograms per cubic meter, which is really not very much compared to any of the other panels that you'll see up above. What's different in those panels is that cooking activities were taking place and then concentrations got in the hundreds of micrograms per cubic meter. So second panel from the bottom shows a sequen sequential stir fry. So every orange bar shows whenever we cooked the same stir fry. So lots of differences between the different volunteers and their, their um, idea of how to cook a stir fry, even though the ingredients were the same. But in, you know, over all in all, you can tell uh, the story here. Whenever we cook, we see high emissions of particulate matter. A layer day was trying to create a representation of an, a regular day where we cooked. You see here a breakfast peak. Then we did some cleaning, no particles were emitted. And then cooking for lunch, more particles. I think this was just a piece of toast. So there was a tiny little peak at the bottom. And then, um, then we had a beef chili for dinner and then some bleach mopping, which actually generated particles, but they can't see in this, they can't be seen in this plot. We actually observed some new particle formation in some, some of these um, bleach mopping events. And finally, the, the, the mother load of all the particle um, exposure during home chem was a simulated Thanksgiving day. And you can see several hours of cooking took place throughout the entire day lots of particles being emitted. The most interesting point that I'll think that I'll point out here, my last point here, is that you see the red line that is leading to up to maybe 100 micrograms per cubic meter of particulate matter. That red line is PM.1 ultrafine particles, which are 100 nanometers or smaller in size. Um, people say that ultrafine particles do not amount to a whole lot of mass, so they don't really count. For towards PM 2.5, and I will argue that depending on the situation, they can. So that's, um, yeah, that was very, very interesting result. Um, kind of sad because we, we all love cooking at home chem. And this is hopefully doesn't serve as a deterrent from cooking. We did not have 
a range hood or any kind of you know mitigation strategy here for these emissions. So uh, finally, I'll just mention briefly that we have a second signature collaborative field campaign planned uh, for this program, second and last before the program sunsets. It's called CASA, um, Chemical Assessments of Surfaces and Air. It's gonna happen in Gatorsburg, Maryland, and because of the pandemic, it got delayed to spring 2022. Hopefully it'll happen soon. Um, we're, we have the same PIs, Delphine and I are, are leading this one as well. Our team leader at NIST is Dustin Poppendick, and we've been having lots of meetings with the NIST team. We're very excited to move on to this different test house and um, investigate a completely new uh, set of research questions. Finally, I'll just acknowledge my the entire home chem and CASA science teams. It's not easy to do a, a large field campaign on a very confined physical space. It's very different from an atmospheric chemistry uh, field study in that standpoint. Uh, so it has it, it's very restrictive in, in lots of ways. And the way you operate the house and the activities you perform in the house are a very important part of the study. So uh, very challenging but extremely rewarding type of work. I highly recommend it. Thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions. So Rich, you are moderating the Q&A. Thank you, Prasant. Um, any questions from anybody? I. I said at the beginning, I think this field is wide open. It's a new frontier. And what uh, people like Tim and Chris bring to this, um, Nina as well, is, is uh, new ways of thinking about the, the area, although Nina was working in this area uh, for some time, but also new weapons, if you will, great new tools. And, and Nina mentioned some of those in the home chem study. It's, a, it's the first time ever that we fit that teams were brought together from multiple universities to take simultaneous measurements with the most sophistic sophisticated instruments uh, that you have for outdoor atmospheric chemistry research on an indoor environment. Nina uh, did a great job along with Delphine Farmer of organizing that entire event. So major kudos to Nina. There were a lot of questions for Tim um, in the chat for, regarding bipolar ionization and ions. I don't know if we want to Tim, do you want to address some of those um, with everybody? I, I added a few comments to, to the chat there. Um, one of the questions actually from yourself was, I think more generally also a question that I've gotten often is, do we expect to see these new particle formation events always if you use an, one of these bipolar ionizers or a specific class? And I think um, this is again a question that sort of often comes back to things that we've learned in outdoor atmospheric chemistry is there are specific conditions that lead to new particle formation events that have to do with not only the presence of ions, but the presence of condensable material, such as what Nina was talking about of all the beautiful measurements that they've made of the volatile organic compounds and their condensation products. So you can get more of them if you have oxidants around because you can oxidize the existing volatile organic compounds. So, I guess to, to that first question is, I think it's it's really, uh, you're, you're taking a process that happens outdoors in atmospheric chemistry and you're just amplifying it, you know, times a hundred to be able to, uh, to drive these types of intense events. Um, the second was a question I think about uh, ozone production from these devices and that has a long history, which I sort of kicked back to you, Rich, because you have worked on this for so long is that some of these devices make a lot of ozone, some don't, and some, if you turn them on a year later, seem like they make a, a different amount than they did before. So uh, that was the, the second question I addressed, but I did actually push that over to you, Rich, since you've thought about that one. Yeah, and I would say that the allowable limits for ozone are based on ozone and not based upon all of the reaction products that have formed from indoor chemistry. So the allowable limits are really missing an important part of the potential uh, health risks to people in the indoor environment. Anna? So one question we like to ask researchers in this forum sometimes is, what kind of collaborator, what kind of tool, new skill would you like to bring into your team to kind of like go to the next level, like the next challenging question? What, what is, you know, what are you looking for um, to partner up and, and, and move the research forward? 
Saif, is this a, a response for that question? Actually, not response to that question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether uh, someone studied why ozone is generated. So I was looking at ionizing gas or air particle at much lower voltage, like two, three order of magnitude lower voltage. And we used some nanoparticles, we engineered them to be even lower. So we ionized some of the uh, gas molecules at even six, eight or 10 volts. But I did study that time whether we were generating ozone or not. And Citrus recently funded me to uh, study whether we could uh, ionize gases at much lower voltage. And one uh, uh, assumption I had was that we'll not be able to, uh, we'll be able to generate uh, ions without generating ozones. Uh, 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 but I was wondering whether you have any insight in that. I'll share some of the references from my group. Tim, do you want to respond to that? Oh, yeah, I can respond. Chris, yeah. Chris? Tim, go ahead, please. I, I mean, of course, all of these devices are different, and it's not always clear exactly what the mechanism is that people are employing in the devices. Um, but in the, in the small number of devices that we have looked at, there are certainly devices that, make, that generate ions without generating ozone in terms of what that, what that discharge voltages are. Um, in, when they're directly out of the box as new devices, not after they've been running continuously for long periods of time. So my guess is when the tip is very sharp, you probably don't need uh, too much of voltage to uh, ionize particle, but over time, material desorption probably make them blunt and your electronic circuit probably keeps pumping more voltages and that starts generating ozone. I will say if you look at the available literature on this subject, there is a pretty strong correlation between um, the amount of ozone formed and the amount of ions formed. So, you know, if you could develop something, say, that countered that, that would be, that would be, I guess, a positive, unless you're worried about the ion chemistry that happens. Yeah. Other questions? I, 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 I liked Anna's question um, about, you know, I, I think this is a wide open, I really think this is still a wide open frontier. This is an area that just hasn't been extensively studied in the past. There's so much we don't know about indoor chemistry, especially, and indoor, indoor microbiology, but indoor chemistry. Um, and I think that, you know, who are the right people to bring, what kinds of people need to be brought together to address those issues? I, I think Nina mentioned um, you know, the atmospheric chemistry part. I also think bringing, building scientists together with the atmospheric chemists, you know, folks that understand airflow in buildings and the kinds of what happens in buildings in terms of emissions over time of certain chemicals after a building is built is pretty important. Any, any comments on that? Any, anything to add? I'll, I'll add two things, I guess, which is that we can't always bring all the fanciest instruments everywhere. And so there's, there's definitely opportunity for development of new sensors that can get at pollutants of interest in particular and in sensitive and specific ways. Um, some things do that well already, some things we don't do very well already. Um, and the other thing I'll, I'll say just stemming from um, uh, Jonathan Eisen's question and Nina's question earlier is, is I think there's opportunities for connection with the, the medical community and public health community as well. Um, on these types of, of, of issues. And then even more broadly is connecting more with social scientists as well to think about how these aspects work in real environments, you know, as they're used, as they're implemented, as, they, as they're adopted. Um, right, I will say that in terms of chemistry, we know very little on the, the sort of toxicology of a lot of the reaction products that we know are formed. Uh, I think probably over 90% of the reaction products that have been published in the literature, there's no tox data for. So there's a lot there to be done uh, in terms of whether we even care about the reaction products or not. Anything else? So Rich, I think in the interest of time, we will have to close this session, but I think Anna Lucia usually keep the channel open for some time for, yeah. Uh, you know, hallway conversations that you can People have. want to keep chatting, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, before we formally close, I would like to thank uh, uh, Rich uh, and the team from um, engineering and uh, from Wisconsin and Colorado uh, 
to participate in this event. I would like to also remind everyone to uh, about the event that we will have next week. Uh, we are having Dr. David Kessler, who is uh, Chief Science Officer for the White House uh, COVID response team. So please register. It could be a quote unquote sold out event. So please register early and uh, we will see you all hopefully next week, same time, same screen. Okay, <laughs> thanks.